will appear. Well, let's move into our presentation, and I am extremely happy to have with us today Dr. William Curtis. Dr. Curtis was educated at Baylor University and also at the University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio. His residency in family medicine was at the Corpus Christi Family Medicine Program. He is a founder of Future Focus Family Medicine, and this is uh, the best that mainstream medicine has to offer because they integrate traditional Western medicine, the best of, with nutritional and holistic therapies and interventions to be able to provide more optimal outcomes for their patients. He has a special interest in chronic medical conditions, especially with regards to their origins and their connection to nutrition and lifestyle. And so it is with uh, a great deal of delight that I introduce you today to Dr. William Curtis. Welcome, Dr. Curtis. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be uh, joining you today. Thank you. Well, today we're going to talk about diabetes and how to uh, turn the tides on this terrible illness. So thank you so much for joining us. And to start our discussion, can you tell us a little bit about your clinic and where you're located? Sure. <clears throat> well, I practice in Corpus Christi, Texas, which is on the southern coast along the Gulf of Mexico. I work in um, <clears throat> Nueces County, which if you do any kind of demographic searches online, you'll find that uh, this is a very, very high population of diabetics. That's why I have a big interest in, in this topic we're covering today. Um, it, there's a huge Hispanic population in this area, and the genetics for diabetes are very prominent in that community. <clears throat> it's not unusual. I was looking at my schedule today. Three out of ten patients coming through are type 2 diabetics. And that's, I know that's higher than most other areas of the country. Nueces County is a real hotbed for uh, this type of disease, and it's something I deal with every day. Uh, now, you as far have... as the clinic, you know, I approach this from a nutritional standpoint primarily. We like to look at this and not just look at why this is, uh, you know, kind of just treat the disease, manage it, if you will. I like to dig deeper, and when you do that, I realize that uh, – Quite frankly, uh, most of the time, uh, these people can cure their condition. They can reverse it or put it in remission, and that's why uh, I think practicing in this environment, I have lots of chances to practice that. So you really do have a unique philosophy regarding the integration of, of treatments. So what does this mean for your uh, patients with diabetes? Well, uh, essentially, um, when a patient comes to us and we identify them in a traditional means for, for diabetes, what we're uh, what, what they're going to get differently with us is they're going to be basically hand fed a um, what I call real health information. They're going to get um, nutrition first and then lifestyle um, information next. We're going to try to have them link the idea of them having diabetes to what they're doing, not necessarily look at it as something that happened to them that they have no control over. I have found uh, that that is, uh, gets me the best results when I have that attitude about diabetes. So let's start off uh, with our group here to talk a little bit uh, about diabetes. I think all of us know what type of disease it is, but when a person comes to you, what do you do to diagnose that person with diabetes? Okay, so say a person comes to, uh, to see us, what I primarily look for first are physical findings. Um, there is, uh, you know, I often tell people I'm a cattle rancher on the side, and you can determine what an animal, a really good rancher, can look at an animal and tell what they've eaten. And they can tell based on their shape and size and various things like that, whether they're grain-fed, grass-fed, that type of thing. People are really the same way. Our bodies are give telltale signs as to what uh, medical problems they may have internally. So. For instance, a, a common patient might be, uh, you know, let's say a 45-year-old woman that comes in. Uh, she, I might note initially that she's overweight, has some belly fat in the midsection. She might have acanthosis nigrans, which is a dark, uh, uh, kind of leathery-looking skin on the back of the neck. Um, and uh, she, typically these patients, when you do basic screening work, will have key features. They'll have elevated blood sugar. They might have high triglycerides, low good cholesterol, high total cholesterol, um, and, of course, often they're overweight, so their BMIs are often elevated. So I first look at physical findings, and then I start uh, uh, proceeding with typical kind of Western medicine type things, if you will, to look for the uh, metabolic symptoms, which is elevated blood sugar, an average blood sugar that's at least greater than 6 to 6.5. That's the hemoglobin A1C. 
Um, sometimes I will use insulin levels uh, if I feel like a case is vague. Um, I sometimes will look for elevated insulin levels, although, quite frankly, the insulin levels are up anytime you see somebody have some uh, belly fat deposition. So that's what I look for when I look for a diabetic um, and uh, how they might get started with us. Excellent. So a lot of people have been told that they have high blood sugar, but they don't have type 2 diabetes, or that right. they're heading in that direction. Right. Sometimes they use the word pre-diabetes. Right. So what becomes the tipping point when you move from, well, your blood sugars are running a little high to you actually have diabetes? Well, that's a, it's a good point, and, and I will tell you that uh, I base, um, I like to base what I, the recommendations I give on outcomes. There's a lot of research out there that shows that people who are pre-diabetics, um, they do not have a hemoglobin A1C in the diabetic range, their blood sugars are not technically in the diabetic range, but they have several of the metabolic features, maybe they're overweight, maybe their blood sugar is slightly elevated. These people have the same risk factor for heart disease as people who are diabetics. So the point I'm making is that if you have prediabetes, in my mind, it makes no difference. You have, this, you, might, you have the same risk factors for all the things we're trying to prevent, especially heart disease, which is the big killer with diabetes. You have the same risk factors. So therefore, I'm much, I, I guess you would consider me much more aggressive uh, with the patients instead of saying, oh, phew, you know, you're a, you're a pre-diabetic. Instead, I'm going to approach that and say, look, this is, this is all the symptoms are there. You have elevated insulin. You have belly fat deposition. Your sugars are borderline. You have the same risk factor right now for heart disease as you do if we waited until this became full-blown diabetes. Can I keep in mind, full-blown diabetes is just a, uh, that's an arbitrary line that, you know, scientists and doctors have put out there. So the reality is we should be, because the statistics show people are much, the same likelihood of having a heart attack as known diabetics, we should be much more aggressive with these, quote, pre-diabetics. And so, so I think that... Is any of those symptoms. Mm -hmm. So I think what you're saying is that this is not the type of disease where you either have it or you don't. So I think that too many people, perhaps, when they're told they're pre-diabetic, feel that they do not have the disease yet, but they're heading in that direction. But what you're saying is that no matter what degree of elevation of blood sugar with some of these other metabolic changes that occur that that needs to be addressed and needs to be brought back into the normal range because you are still increasing cardiovascular risk. Yes, you must, you must answer for why those physical and metabolic changes are occurring. You must, you must look back at your activities and your, your behaviors and nutritional habits and whatnot. You must look at those. That's exactly right. So we see this explosion in the number of people with diabetes. So do you have any insights as to what's behind this epidemic? Um, yeah, I, I think I think the food industry in the world and certainly in the United States is busted. Um, we have, uh, starting with where the food is grown, um, modern agriculture, as I mentioned, I'm a rancher, I'm a permaculturist, I like to, I, uh, you know, try to grow a lot of my own food and whatnot. And, and the reason is you got pesticides, herbicides, hormones, all these things designed to enhance growth um, in the modern world. Well, these chemicals um, and the um, amount of starches that are being produced and pushed at the population um, are primarily the problem. I know we could get into issues of inactivity and, you know, the whole Internet generation and everything, and there's definitely an, an, uh, an increase in sedentary behavior and uh, a tendency away from uh, active lifestyles, but I believe it primarily stems and starts with nutrition uh, people are, and, and I, I like to apply the 80-20 principle to everything, and I've done that in several of my blog posts uh, uh, that I've written on health and especially diabetes. There are specific things that make the biggest difference, and I think it's killing uh, a lot of these people and, and it's causing diabetes. One of them is sodas and high fructose corn syrup. Um, the uh, basically liquid carbohydrate and sugar-based calories are too easy to obtain. They're too common in the diet. They're taken for granted. And I have literally seen people lose 15 to 20 pounds in a matter of four to six weeks by um, stopping their two to three Dr. Pepper habit a day um, behavior. It's, it's one focused intervention that can make huge, massive differences. I think that's happening um, nationwide. I mean, I noticed on the slide, you know, Texas is in black. No doubt. 
I can walk through my grocery store right here in Nueces County, and I can tell you, you if, if I wouldn't get punched in the nose for doing a study, I could look at the baskets and look at the, the, the people, and I can tell you exactly why they're having that issue. And it's coming from processed liquid sugars. People walk through the grocery store with entire baskets full of sodas and fruit juices and all these things that are such starchy, sugar-based stuff. It was never meant to be put in our bodies. Our bodies were never meant to eat that quantity of grains. And uh, therein lies the problem because that's what people are eating across the country. That is a completely shocking statistic that in only 15 years, we've moved from three states that have uh, diabetes and more than 6% of their population to 50 states, and I would hazard a guess, Puerto Rico, uh, with 6% or higher. So that, oh, yeah, that's just definitely. shocking, 15 years. So, all right, now we know what the problem is. So you have a lot of ideas about uh, how to put diabetes in remission. Right. And I, I love that term, and I, I think it's a brilliant term that you've coined because even if you get the symptoms completely under control, it's something that you also have to always look out for, correct? That's right. I, you know, first of all, it implies that you can control and you can eliminate the symptoms and signs of diabetes. I, I think that's powerful for a patient. I, I believe that more people need to be um, have a little bit of control over what um, what their outcomes are. But that remission, you're exactly right. The remission means it's a reminder to patient and physician. This is something that can come back, much like a cancer might recur, that type of thing. It's something that can come back if one forgets how you, uh, uh, how you achieved or re reversed the condition. Um, so, I, yeah, I like to use that term. It makes people feel I, – I love writing that in the chart. There's really not a diagnostic code I can use for that, but I actually will actually take diabetes off their medical list. I'll put it in my EMR system as a, uh, a resolved complaint, and I will list it as a di in remission. Will I continue to follow them? Yes, I will. But uh, I love that term. So what are so let's define it. So what you're looking at a variety of parameters to say that their diabetes is in remission. Sure. Yeah. Well, there's a few key things. First of all, we talked about the insulin in the intro there. About uh, insulin is a disease of diabetes, by the way. So a lot of these are uh, physical parameters and um, chemical parameters that I'm looking for are related to insulin. So uh, I'm looking for belly fat deposition or resolution of that. If a person still has a lot of belly fat deposition, they are not in, uh, in remission. So what I see when I treat a patient like this, their belly fat is dropping, and if you were to measure them, their, their fasting insulin levels are lower. And uh, that, so, so lower and normalizing insulin level is a feature. Normalize A1C. This is not a lower A1C. This is in the normal range. So this is, remember, this is your average blood sugar test is what a hemoglobin A1C is. So I'm looking for that number to drift all the way into the normal range, uh, and that then I will define them as in remission. Also, very key, you can't do this with medications. So if you're on a medication and your A1C is now in the normal range, that's awesome, but you're, I would not consider you in a diabetic remission. At that point, I would start to work with you on how to get rid of the medication and see if you stay in the normal range with the hemoglobin A1C. Last, uh, the other one is uh, triglycerides and HDL. Uh, triglycerides and HDL cholesterol are both directly uh, impacted by sugar intake in the diet, and therefore they're good indicators for me as to how careful the patient has been with their carbohydrate intake. So a lot of people that will come in and they'll say, well, you know, I did it, I'm, I'm improving a little bit, but, my, but I, I still can't quite get my diabetes under complete control. Well, if you look at their triglycerides, and their triglycerides are still 250, even if they're cutting carbohydrates, they're not cutting enough. And the reason is um, I know uh, that once people's triglycerides get well under 100 or uh, definitely under 120, they're, they're much more likely to be in a ketosis or in a, in a lower carbohydrate um, diet for their genetics. So all of these are caused by metabolic improvements. Um, they're, and this is based on lifestyle and nutrition. In other words, the changes that lead to normalizing insulin, hemoglobin A1C, triglycerides, HDL, this is all done through nutrition and lifestyle primarily. Excellent. Excellent. So, you're, so um, let's take just a brief moment before we look at more integrative treatment, but the conventional treatments that you use for um, to put people into diabetics to try to head towards that good direction with their diabetes. Right. 
Yeah, well, so conventionally, um, you're, you're going to – I monitor patients just like every other doctor in, in my community. In other words, I'm going to check blood sugar levels. I'm going to monitor a hemoglobin A1C every three to four months. I'm going to assess cardiovascular risk, risk factors. Now, it's a topic for another day. I don't believe that uh, – I don't believe cholesterol is a disease inherently, but I do believe it gives us – a cholesterol profile gives us a – uh, a window into the body. It tells us about the metabolism, just like we talked about with triglycerides. It tells me about nutrition. It tells me about the state of inflammation in their body. Um, so assessing risk factors. Um, I will, uh, if it's, uh, if I feel a patient has uh, either not um, uh, fully committed to trying to do something different lifestyle-wise, or if their sugars are critically high, um, I will go ahead and start on medications. I usually rarely will use insulin. Uh, in fact, usually most of my efforts are spent um, trying to remove insulin from patients. Uh, but I typically, I'll follow the same, um, you know, kind of typical treatment patterns that most physicians will. I do, I, you know, the traditional way to treat diabetes is with card counting, American Diabetic Association, DASH diets, these types of things. I do not follow those. I think they're outdated. Um, they are not effective, and uh, many of those um, – Many of those types of uh, programs are, are too lenient, in my opinion, with carbohydrate intake, and they downplay the absolute role in the cause of the genetic expression of diabetes by eating carbohydrates. And so uh, these, this whole idea that you just have to eat a grain, uh, no way. Well, let's talk about your integrative treatment. So sure. how would you describe your approach to treating diabetes? Okay, so the first way I'm going to look at it first is I, I take a very detailed history about nutrition, and I want to know very, very upfront, I want to know are there issues um, with uh, junk processed carbohydrates in the diet. Those would be the first things that as soon as I see somebody walk in and I've identified that they have diabetes, I want to know what their dietary history is, and I go through great pains with this. Sometimes people try to duck that. They don't want to really talk about their nutrition, and I think that's partially because they know that's where a lot of this comes from. But what I will do is I'll, I'll very, uh, ask very much so about alcohol intake, about um, sodas, about sweets, about food cravings that they have, because food cravings tell us a lot about uh, our metabolism and our hormonal status. I will then, um, and I will typically put them on a, what I would call a uh, lower carbohydrate uh, primal slash paleo style diet, where I'm asking them to essentially eliminate all grains. Um, I eliminate all processed sugars. Um, I want them, of course, sodas and alcohols gone. Um, and then I will encourage, I, I will usually start with that, and I will tell them, I want you to focus on nutrition first. And some of them will ask, what about exercise? And I'll say, well, exercise is fine, and if you fill up to it, great. But I want you to focus your energies on changing some nutritional habits. And I work through them with goals to do so. Um, as you, uh, and I, I know the slide you put up on nutrition, that's a great uh, kind of 80-20 summary. First things I always tell people, so does alcohol and processed sugar. If you're not eliminating those, you will not get to diabetic remission. You will not, okay? It has to be a consistent effort. Sometimes diabetics will say, what do I take if I, if I, if I just got to have something sweet? I'll tell them fruit might be the sweetest thing you eat, maybe a piece of apple, an orange, or something like that. And um, I'll tell them to take that with a little uh, a nut butter, like a, like a peanut butter or something like unsweetened peanut butter. This would slow the carbohydrate intake, plus it's a complex carb, so it's the lesser of evils. But if you don't get these top three out of the way, um, you, you won't get there. I also encourage fats. There's so many people running out there um, that are, are doing diets that cause them to count calories. They're, they're hungry all the time. They have food cravings. This is driven by unbalanced neurologic behavior, and I believe that's driven by um, inadequate um, fat intake. So I'm going to encourage natural and healthy fats, which include eggs, avocados, uh, fish, um, fat that's from uh, maybe grass-fed meat, things like that. These are, these are things that we should have in the diet. I know there's people that get confused by that. You know, should I eat eggs? Should I not eat eggs? Yes, you should eat eggs. This, these types of foods will calm the central nervous system. They will satiate the brain so you're not hungry and having these weird, weird uh, swings of uh, cravings all day. And, of course, you've got to start avoiding rice, potatoes, grains, cereals, and bread. These are starchy, kind of bulk starches. Um, that is really the key um, to gaining, re uh, you know, uh, remission in addition to uh, increasing physical activity. Excellent. And I noticed down here you say, one, they're in remission. This is the, I know that the rest of these are pretty self-explanatory, but uh, I like this term dietary creep. Does that mean that you're doing well until you think, oh, well, one soda is not going to hurt or... Oh, yes. well, one Rice Krispie Treat's not going to hurt. 
Exactly. And, and okay, so every year Christmas rolls around and I'll get a horde of diabetics that come through, you know, January, February, oh, no. March. And, and they've they've all had, you know, like it's the holidays and they kind of chuckle about it. And, well, you know how it is. And the pie was there. And I just, and next thing I know, I went ahead and had, you know, five mixed drinks and a, you know, case of Dr. Pepper. And it's like, it's this creeping behavior that, that um, I, I believe it's cultural and I, I can talk about this later, but it's, uh, the uh, dietary creep is that it, that incremental um, change in diet back to a carbohydrate-laden diet. Keep in mind, there is ample research um, that shows that these a lot of these simple sugars, especially the hardcore stuff that's in diet sodas and, and uh, regular sodas, um, carbohydrate is one of the only addicting food types, okay? And it will cause a behavior that will, will lead to eating more and more of it as time goes on. Uh, so I call that dietary. That's scary. Patients That's avoided. really frightening. Uh, d- um, the, uh, there's, you know, even look at the, the, the uh, artificial sweeteners. Aspartame has been shown to be more addicting than crack cocaine in lab animals um, and has been shown to cause carbohydrate cravings in humans. So, so a lot of people think, oh, well, I'm just going to do diet soda. Well, that's actually causing neurologic effects that will ultimately cause you to have some of this dietary creep or some of these uh, things that you know you shouldn't eat, you'll actually be craving to put them back in your in your diet. So avoiding dietary creep is probably one of the biggest things that if people are vigilant for that, um, that helps keep them in remissions if they've made the right changes to begin with. You know, it's ironic that we see so many overweight people walking around with diet soft drinks. If diet soft drinks helps you lose weight, wouldn't there be a lot more weight loss as much yeah. as they're consumed? Uh, and I've seen diabetics. This is just, I know there's research on this, um, but I have seen diet patients drinking diet sodas that were diabetics that their diabetic improved, uh, improved their diabetes improved after stopping diet sodas. It definitely uh, mimics a sugar uh, in the body. Um, it may not do the same thing, but there are hormonal changes, neurologic uh, signals that are being sent that uh, do not improve diabetes. In fact, exacerbate it. So we've talked a lot about carbs, so I know that you have a lot that you examine and uh, try to balance with regards to lifestyle. Yes. Yeah, one of the things that sometimes, say you get a person that really is doing everything right, and, and they're really close, their A1C is down, maybe in the six range, and maybe they're on uh, a medication or they're not, um, and uh, but you're, you're trying to get them past that final hump, you know, into the remission range. One thing that sort of comes up a lot is the idea that um, stress and other emotional issues um, can indeed affect um, blood sugars. Uh, in short, um, you got to look at how our hormones behave. Say you have a lot of emotional stress, like maybe a job or something that's really stressing you out. That is a fight or flight scenario. You are in a combat situation. You're going to run for your life or fight. It's kind of like a primal response that leads to cortisol elevation. That's our stress hormone. Cortisol does some peculiar things. When it's released because you're stressed, it tells the liver to dump sugar into the bloodstream to prepare the muscles to give them enough fuel to fight or fly, uh, flee. So this is an artificial means, if you will, to, support, to raise blood sugar. So I've had people say, I'm eating everything right. I never eat any carbs. But yet they struggle with their blood sugar control. And then as you dig deeper, you realize this person has tre- they have a marital problem or they have some tremendous stressor in their life grief, um, any uh, death in the family, all these types of things that stress people out, you will see it manifest in their blood sugars. And the reason is this cortisol uh, mechanism whereby the liver is dumping sugar. So you can eat perfect, and the liver is out there dumping too much sugar in the bloodstream. Therefore, your insulin levels have to rise and your symptoms maintain themselves. So paying attention to stress and emotional issues and the hormones that are triggered by that is important. The other thing is uh, medications uh, are probably another thing that people overlook. Um, it's a known fact. It's a black box warning. Uh, several of the antidepressant and anti-psychotic drugs, um, several of these cause diabetes. I mean, it's, it, they cause it. It's a chemical event. It probably, in subtle ways, changes how our neurochemistry works, leads to changes in dietary uh, cravings and, and how uh, these patients eat and their activity level. And then, uh, so, so medications can be an issue. Um, the ones I like uh, that are more important are probably sleep, either lack of or actually sleep disorders. Um, these conditions are basically like sleep stress. Think of it. Think of it as just another. Everything I just said about stress. Think of uh, sleep apnea as stress. Lack of sleep is a stressor. 
uh, pain is a stressor. Um, and the last one, is food allergens, is sort of a little more difficult to understand, but basically when you eat foods that you don't, um, that your body doesn't like, let's say, and, and the most common ones, by the way, are wheat, uh, corn, dairy, and soy. Uh, wheat being probably the highest, dairy being probably the second. When those foods get into the gut, they create inflammation in the lining of the gut wall. That requires cortisol to decrease the inflammation and to repair that tissue. If this goes on for long periods of time, it becomes this silent source of high cortisol levels. It becomes a silent cause for inflammation in the body, which then leads to worsening diabetic control. Food allergens can be a real culprit for people that can't quite get through that final, uh, that final push. They're doing everything right, and then they realize, oh, wow, I didn't realize I was sensitive to this, this, uh, this uh, food type. Um, before we move on to the next branch, when you were talking about medications, uh, wasn't there recent research that the cholesterol-lowering medications put people at greater risk for type 2 diabetes? Yeah, bingo. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, th there's uh, there's a really interesting stuff about statin drugs that people need to wake up and take a, take a look at. Um, there is evidence out there in uh, several studies that are showing that statin drugs appear to trigger diabetes. There's also one, I, I, I'd have to look it up, but I, I posted on this uh, last year sometime on two independent research articles that came out that showed taking statin drugs actually enhances calcifications in arteries. Um, and this was two independent researchers independent of drug companies. Um, and they, they, they came to the same conclusion that, eat, that taking the statin drugs not only didn't reverse placking in the arteries or cholesterol deposition, it in fact seemed to enhance it. Uh, this, the, all this stuff, you, this is the you know, stuff that is really frustrating in medicine, that these things are taken as the gospel. And the reality is we focus on these medicines and the side effects, but people can change this through the nutrition and their habits that they use every day. So when you have patients come to see you, do you, if it's at all possible, try to get them off of these uh, cholesterol-lowering medications, the antidepressants and the antipsychotics? Yes, absolutely. I'm a minimalist when it comes to meds. Don't get me wrong. I, I have an MD behind my name. I was traditionally trained. Um, I understand what I was taught. I was, I was good at it. I, I, I understand how the body works, and I understand the theories and the toolbox that I was given. Um, but what I have found is if you're honest about how you treat patients, you realize that um, sometimes these medicines that you were taught are the right thing to do um, don't necessarily make any difference. I'll t give you a personal story. Just recently, I treated a patient, uh, one of my favorite patients. He's in his mid-70s. Um, he's been on a cholesterol med for in excess of 20 years. And um, he now, uh, we just diagnosed him with blocked arteries in his heart, uh, massively blocked arteries in his neck. And he's now having surgeries and everything for that. He's been at goal. His cholesterols were below the goal range for the last 20 years. Okay, It didn't save him. It didn't make it any different. He developed vascular disease anyway. And that's the point when a, as a, as an honest physician looks at cases like that all the time. And you can either say, well, hmm, I don't know, it must be something else. Must, they, must not be, they must be cheating on their diet or something. But the reality is the medicines could be causing it. And secondarily, um, the reality is I, I, don't, I don't think they're doing what they were prescribed to do to begin with. So, yes, the answer is I do try to, I do try to minimize the usage or totally eliminate them when I can do so. So let's talk about your interventions. Sure. So first, let's start with some of the supplements you commonly use. Yeah. First off, I use nutrition first. Supplements are always second. Um, sometimes um, when people get lower into carbohydrates, uh, they often don't eat enough vegetables. So I will increase fiber intake. And if they just, you, know, you get some people that just will not eat vegetables, I'll tell them at least, uh, you know, Metamucil or this type of uh, fiber that's a non-sugar-based fiber. Um, sometimes I'll use gymnema. I find that this particular herb uh, tends to help with cravings, and even sometimes some preparations of it, you can allow it to di um, You can have them soak it on their, just let it dissolve on their tongue, and they'll actually have, it'll actually cut their taste for sugar. Um, so I play with it that way, and I also have done work with patients that only wanted to take gymnema alone, and they tend to have lower sugars over time. There's pretty good research that shows it does lower hemoglobin A1Cs over time. Um, as far as medications, this is kind of an area that I spend a lot of time with patients. Usually if I have to do a medication, I'll start with metformin in its first line in traditional world, and I think it's a reasonable thing to try in the short gun just to lower sugars if the sugars are so high that it's causing the patient physical symptoms. 
And it also, uh, other interesting thing about metformin, it doesn't tend to cause hypoglycemia. That's one of the things with a lot of the medicines that are out there. Say I tell you diet and lifestyle, but your sugars are so high that you're getting up to pee every three hours at night. I have to put you on something to help control that symptom. But if I don't put you on something like metformin, I may be causing you severe hypoglycemic symptoms whenever you start following my nutrition and lifestyle plans. So I try to start with metformin and I try to give the person at least three to four months to make some dietary changes. If I have to add medications, if a person is either uh, thinks I'm a quack and doesn't want to follow that advice or wants to, uh, you know, just uh, doesn't, doesn't choose to um, follow those um, protocols, then basically I only add one medication at a time and I will typically maximize the dose of one before moving on to another. Remember, every time you add a medicine, anything over three medications, you have a 100% chance of drug-to-drug -drug interactions. And that includes caffeine, alcohol, aspirin, Tylenol, all these things are over the counter. If you take more than three of those at any given time, you have a 100% chance of some type of interaction. Um, lastly, I avoid insulin unless completely necessary, meaning the patient, get, some type 2 diabetics get to the point where they um, do not really make enough insulin. They've kind of burned their pancreas out. And those patients, I will give them absolute minimum doses and insist that they, they uh, uh, follow dietary programs. A lot of the complementary things I recommend are meant to um, target um, the stress sort of lifestyle aspect of this, getting people to slow down, take more um, care with their bodies. Uh, tai Chi, Qigong, Yoga, these are all kind of martial art techniques of various backgrounds that help people understand the connection between their mind and their body. Meditation, of course, is a feature of all three of those. Um, Weight-bearing exercise. Uh, primarily, I like diabetics to use um, resistance training, maybe even weightlifting kind of thing, body weight calisthenics. Um, aerobics are fine, but I, I prefer body weight uh, calisthenics, and the reason is that helps build muscles. Building muscles, building uh, stronger muscles and more uh, uh, larger muscles creates muscular sponges. They become blood sugar sponges. Every time you work out and you lift weights and you feel that burn, you have used up all the glycogen or sugar stores in that muscle. Now it becomes a sponge. Isn't that a great thing uh, in a way you could control and lower your blood sugar? And of course, sleep, uh, and again, part of the idea is getting people to slow down and address the fact that they do need to rest, they do need to get plenty of sleep. So these are some of the just generic uh, complementary things that I typically recommend. Uh, isn't it true that muscle at rest burns more blood sugar than other types of body tissues at rest? Yeah, uh, I do a lot of work with athletes, and uh, that is actually true. In fact, you burn more energy repairing and refueling the muscle than you did during the exercise itself. So say mm -hmm. you go out and get a really good burn going uh, doing a weightlifting program or whatever, you're going to burn more um, sugar. You're going to absorb more sugar and store it in that muscle over the course of several hours than you would immediately during the exercise, the intense exercise. And when you were discussing medications, um, we, we kind of went over this a little quickly, but you, you said that you avoid insulin um, just as, and, you, and even if you do have to use the, you use the absolute minimalist dosages, yes. why, why do you have a concern about using insulin? Because it really does bring the blood sugars down. Now, going back, um, sugar is not the disease of diabetes. Insulin is. I am, I am very firmly convinced that insulin is the problem. There have been animal studies that showed that um, you can take, uh, in fact, they took dogs and they, they infused through an artery in the leg um, a stream of insulin. Just to, it, They didn't circulate to the rest of their body. They just ran it through the vessel to see what effect it had on the vessel. It, within a few doses, it already had placking inside the vessel, meaning there is an inflammatory process that goes on when insulin stays high for too long. Okay? So... If that's the case, if that's true, and of course people with diabetes, it's unchecked. They have well, the primary issue they have is not the sugar; it's the high insulin that's the problem. And so what happens is, um, I believe insulin, even if I give it exogenously, if I give it as a treatment because their sugars are five or six hundred, I believe in some small way I'm probably not doing them any favors because I'm introducing more insulin into their system. We all feel better. You know, I get a little blue ribbon checkbox because I, I did their A1C and I got it down a little bit, but I see that they're gaining weight. I see that they're, um, you know, they're feeling tired and sluggish. And, I, and, and the reality is the insulin isn't fixing anything. It's just moving the sugar somewhere else. 
Um, and, there's a, and, and so because of my concerns that insulin actually could be the primary problem even with vascular disease, um, I try to avoid it at all costs only whenever there's toxicity issues with the blood sugar itself. Well, since we understand that insulin is what transports sugar to the inside of the cells to be utilized for burning and turning into energy, then why is it that people with diabetes have high levels of insulin but yet are not transporting the sugar inside the cell for proper burning? Well, the body, um, everything in the body works on a bell curve, and um, there's receptors in the, in the walls of cells. Those receptors change. They can adapt to the environment that they're in. But because of that bell curve, they can only adapt so far, and then they start to lose their ability to keep up with whatever the imbalance is. So if your sugar is consistently high in the bloodstream, you make, uh, you make insulin to try to put it in. That's a lock and key mechanism that there, there becomes a point where the, the, um, you either run out of keys or you run out of doors and you can't get the sugar uh, into the cell anymore. Um, and, uh, and, and so what happens is the sugar tends to drift higher and higher and higher despite um, the fact that your body tried to upregulate the insulin to make it higher so that you could get it into the cells or out of the bloodstream. It's, um, one has to look at how cells, uh, how the uh, membrane of a cell works and how things get in and out of them. They usually get in and out through a, uh, an enzyme mechanism, and um, that can be overwhelmed. And what happens in diabetics is they overwhelm the normal balance and the normal, um, uh, the, the normal compensation mechanisms. So is that the definition of insulin resistance? I believe it is. Excellent, excellent. You also mentioned that um, that you only intervene in the blood sugars, that one of the things that you intervene is if they're having symptoms. And you men mentioned frequent urination. Can you give us a couple of other top symptoms you see when people are starting to have difficulties with high blood sugars? Sure. Um, one of the, when, when sugars are really high, um, a lot of times people are losing weight, and they think, oh, awesome, I'm losing weight, but I feel really sick all the time. This is because they're not getting sugar into their cells appropriately. That's, that's one of the things. Um, they will also often just be thirsty all the time. Um, they will be craving water or drinking nonstop, and they never can quench their thirst. Um, fatigue is a very common symptom. A lot of people overlook fatigue. Um, and, of course, frequent urination or nocturia, where you're having to get up over and over to, to go. Uh, those are the things that um, I see the most um, uh, with patients. It's, it's pretty much a dead giveaway. You'll see a patient come in haven't seen them in a while, they, you know they have diabetes, they've lost 25 pounds, and you ask them, have you been dieting? And they said, no. And by the way, I'm frequently urinating and I'm thirsty. Then you know that whatever their A1C was before, it's going to be massively worse now because their blood sugar control has gotten way worse. So let's talk about, we've talked a lot about those types of interventions. Let's talk about the dietary intervention. So you have a dietary plan to get mm -hmm. folks in uh, diabetes remission. Right. Well, um, again, it's focused. Um, I generally want people eating real food. Um, I want people to make sure that they uh, are not ever eating sodas. I want them to severely limit or not have alcohol at all, especially if they're diabetics. No fruit juice. Fruit juice is not good for you. Okay? Fruit occasionally, but not fruit juice. Um, I like people on a, a low-carbohydrate diet, which means um, I typically want them at least less than 50 grams a day. But again, you, there is plenty of evidence and this is what I actually push my diabetics to do, get out of the concept of feeling like you need to eat a, a bread, a, a, a carb. Get out of that mentality. You don't have to eat them. You can eat vegetables, which is kind of a non-digestible carb for the most part, um, and you can, you can keep your carbohydrate intake exceedingly low. The more you do, the less stress you put on the body, the less insulin you require, um, and the more your body is able to get into ketosis, which is that kind of... Uh, a fat burning mode where we're not using sugar as the primary source of metabolism. Um, and so I would push those concepts first. I do want my diabetics to monitor their blood sugars. Um, that's something that um, I think is important because uh, I heard it once said that that which gets measured gets managed. Sometimes people blissfully go through their lives. A lot of diabetics don't have symptoms. They just have it. And their arteries are corroding and they're having all the damage to diabetes, but they don't know it because they're not cognizant of it. I believe that by going ahead and um, making people measure their sugars, especially after meals, they say, well, is it okay if I eat fruit? I'll tell them, I don't know. Why don't you go ahead and test your sugar after? 
And if they're really an unstable diabetic, their sugar will jump through the roof. And then, they, then that scares them. They're like, oh, my gosh, I didn't realize it went that high. And so that, again, teaches them. They're learning. They're empowered to control it themselves. The last thing that's very key is I ask these people to observe for little improvements. Um, observe for little changes. Hey, I'm not urinating as frequently. I'm losing a couple of inches. I sleep good. My libido's better. Hey, uh, was I supposed to quit having headaches? I mean, there's all kinds of little things that start to improve. So I ask my patients to, to journal, to, to write down how they feel, to look for improvements, even as small as, as uh, changes in their skin. Uh, I've seen people have changes in their um, acne, you know, these types of things. And also, of course, we want to monitor for uh, change because a lot of times I'm looking to get rid of medications. I'm on the hunt to eliminate a lot of these meds I'm writing for the patient. A lot, one of the concerns that I've heard from individuals who do follow a low-carb diet, some individuals uh, say that they have terrible problem with bad breath and, night, and dry mouth. Is this always a consequence of ketosis? And if so, is there anything that you could do from a dietary standpoint to help reduce this? Um, that is not always the case, and I would encourage those individuals. I mean, there's an acetone-type smell that can sometimes occur, um, I would encourage those folks. I find that that's more when people are transitioning to a low-carb diet, um, and I would encourage them to kind of continue with that. But I would also secondarily um, make sure that they take a real hard look at their um, um, routine blood work and make sure they're otherwise healthy, uh, make sure they're not having other digestive problems, um, teeth problems, um, or, or things like that, because sometimes that is they, they take that as it's because of diet, and sometimes it's because of other comorbidities that they may have. Uh, I don't see that as a huge issue, and so I don't find it something that I'm trying to get patients to cover up. It's, I think that's a transitionary issue. One other thing about it, I believe part of that comes from the detoxification process that occurs when you move to more natural food types, when you get away from processed sugars, uh, heavily diets heavily laden with grain. These are things that uh, are toxic to the body, and the body takes a while to shed some of these, and sometimes it's shed as a vapor in the form of breath. Sometimes it's passed in the urine. Urine smells different. Sometimes the stool changes. Um, so, Because uh, you see the same thing whenever you get people on detox programs and things like that. So I think uh, that's something I would, uh, I, would cont I would watch, but if it's severe, I would make sure you get checked up, especially by a dentist or an uh, internist, to make sure your uh, GI tract is okay. Um, a lot of people are completely overwhelmed when they get a diagnosis of diabetes, especially if they had no forewarning. Uh, so how do you, do you have any special tips to share about how you coach patients to make lasting changes? Well, first thing is I, I always talk about a thing called goal tending. Um, I believe in the value and the power of very small incremental goals. Sometimes when the doctor comes in and tells you you have diabetes, there's this sort of, sort of overwhelming as soon as you walk out the door, oh, I can't do this, I can't do that, I can't do, you know, it's, it's just like this overwhelming number of things. I actually like people to focus on a few big items like we've already covered. I'll tell them, look, yep, you got diabetes, there's a lot of things you're going to need to learn about this. We're going to monitor you, we're going to check all these things to make sure you don't have progression of disease. But the first thing I want you to do is I want you to walk out of this door, and until I see you back at your three- to four-week follow-up, I don't want another soda to pass your lips. I don't want you to drink any fruit juice, and I don't want you to drink any alcohol. Can you try that as a baby step for the next few weeks, and we'll see what kind of progress you make? And then the next time when they come in, I'll say, okay, now let's talk more about grains. Let's talk more about simple sugars in your diet. I'd like you now, since you've had so much success there, I'd like you to go ahead and start watching out for these foods in the diet. Why don't we try to eliminate at least 75% of those? Baby step. And then finally they'll come in, and because of those things, they feel good. They have more energy, which is why I, I call our, our little uh, nutritional book Energy uh, Diet and Lifestyle Compass. Patients talked about having more energy. And so I'll say, hey, look, let's take another step. Why don't you start exercising then? This is how these baby steps that occur, I don't, I, I'm not one that believes in the radical, you know, um, do everything at once. I, I've, I've worked with people um, that that's their approach. I have, uh, I've seen them have great success, but I've also seen a lot of people fall to the wayside because they don't realize um, that it's difficult for people to change every single habit, especially when stress and lifestyle issues can be involved. Loved ones at home, people who they have to eat with them, 
I mean, it takes a while to convince people to change. I look at it more as I'm trying to treat them for a lifetime. I'm trying to educate them for a lifetime so that they can cure their own condition. A lot of the folks in our audience, um, some of them are practitioners, I noticed, by those who've signed up, and some of them are people who themselves have diabetes. Right. And they might have been dealing with high blood sugars or de dealing with this disease for months or years. Have you had patients that have had poor health for a very long time and you're still able to make some changes? Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, I've got, uh, I've definitely got um, uh, many folks, uh, you put them in the elderly category, that um, have had uh, diabe achieved diabetic remission. Um, some of those folks are retired and they, they don't, uh, they, they, they have the time to make some changes. So I think that whole old dog, new trick, I'm not 100% I'm not sure that that's uh, necessarily true. Um, I will say that it is a more of an uphill battle trying to re-educate them because they've had generations of what I call nutritional misinformation. You know, I'm, th these folks that are 60, 70 years old, they've, in their lifetime, eggs have been bad for you, eggs have been good for you, and they've been bad for you three or four times back and forth. And they don't know what to believe. They get easily confused. Um, but I, in my opinion, yeah, I've seen people uh, metabolically improve diabetes dramatically and, in fact, uh, even achieve remission. The toughest ones for me are the ones that work, and they work excessive hours. In our area of the world, we have a lot of oil fill workers, guys that work on the road a lot. These guys are the toughest ones to treat because you tell them, hey, you got to eat better, you got to watch what you eat, you got to be more active, and they're working 17, 18-hour days, um, seven days a week, 365 days a year, and they kind of look at you and think, well, you know, how am I going to do that? And those are the toughest ones for me, and it requires a lot of uh, the patient to do a lot of soul searching to try to figure out, you know, oh, is this something I want to do my whole life? Am I going to, you know, have diabetes and make a lot of money, or am I going to, you know, moderate my time and, and improve my diabetic control? So before we move into questions, and we have quite a few that are um, starting in our, our Q&A box, um, okay. give us, a, your, again, this is your overview for achieving diabetic remission. Sure, yeah. Um, so big tips. Um, I like my patients to become food snobs. I want them to care where their food comes from. I want them to care how much carbohydrate they're taking in. I want them to know that aspartame is bad for you, high fructose corn syrup is bad for you. I want them to know that chemicals like MSG and uh, food dyes and uh, preservatives are all bad for you. Um, I want them to care about the quality and the taste of their food because when they do that, they're going to eat higher quality food and typically um, they're going to have better outcomes. I want them to cut through the propaganda. We've kind of hit on and off over some of the medical, medical propaganda, pharmaceutical industries, um, a lot of the things that people have to look at, even varying uh, guidelines, even amongst low-carb people, there's a lot of, uh, you know, are you paleo, are you, are you primal, are you Atkins, you know, all these low-carb. The bottom line is they're all in the right island. And the reality is I want people to get the big picture that they have to eat differently and they have to eat better and there are specific things they can do. I also don't want them to accept condition behavior. We touched on that earlier. That's the holiday situation where it's like culturally people do certain things just because it's their habit, it's what they were taught. I reject that. I, I, don't, I don't think just because it's Easter um, we should go eat candied Easter eggs. Um, and, and you think, oh, that's so cruel to your children or whatever. You know, It's not. It's really not. It's the best thing for them. And if they don't learn that culturally, then it won't be a, it won't be a problem for them health-wise as time goes on. But we can, even as adults, even if that's what we were taught, we can reject that. Also, the, the, one of the other tips is on challenging yourself. All the patients that I've had that achieve diabetic remission sort of start to take on this attitude of, I'm going to push myself. I'm going to challenge myself. I'm going to stop this habit, this behavior, and I want to see what gets better. I'm going to, I'm going to see if that helps. And... Uh, so they get this real, they start to get this can-do attitude of the, that they can improve themselves. So challenge yourself. Push yourself to learn new things. Try to learn about what I'm teaching nutritionally. And the last one is live an active life. Um, I've gotten really big here lately into talking about food production, gardening, permaculture, and how it relates to health. Um, I want people to get out and do the 5K on the weekend. I want them to go for a walk. I want them to uh, go out and play with their kids. Um, enjoy being outside. These are things that are, I call it the action lifestyle. Take the stairs at work. Um, there's so many things that, that um, can make you more active, which in turn uh, improves diabetic control. And universally, the folks that have, have achieved diabetic remission have all sort of taken that uh, action lifestyle. Excellent. 
Uh, let's look for a moment at um, this Diabetes World Summit that is upcoming. I have been hearing some fabulous information about this. Can you tell us what this is about? Yeah, so anyway, I'm, I'm going to be one of the presenters in this uh, Diabetes Summit. Um, it is a program they're putting together. It's an online summit. Um, it begins next um, May 5th through 16th uh, next month. Um, there's over 50 um, physicians, nutritionists, um, uh, uh, alternative healers, and also uh, exercise uh, folks, uh, uh, trainers and whatnot, with worldwide experience, um, well-known individuals, people writing books on these topics, all getting together. There's going to be about four presentations daily. They're going to be posted free online if you sign up. And what ends up happening is uh, you can, you'll get all of that knowledge for free, and all you have to do is just sit down and listen to those podcasts in the evening. I think it is a huge, important thing. It's not unusual to have diabetic summits and all these types of things, but again, what are they going to talk about at those? It's going to be what medicines are the best things to do, what, is, uh, what does Merck tell us is the best uh, drug to use for this condition. This is about how people can take, take control and understand what's out there that can actually reverse this condition. I'm really excited about this. Excellent. I know there's going to be a lot of information on that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, uh, before we move into Q&A, I just want to focus on this. This is your website, yes, to find out more information about your practice, Future Focus? Yeah, so, sure. If uh, somebody's interested in uh, kind of talking to us about our practice, um, we're in Corpus Christi, Texas, and the best way to get a hold of us is our contact information is at the futurefocusmd.com website. And then if, if any of your uh, listeners like kind of the, my, my approach, um, want to learn more about specific health, nutrition, lifestyle, or even uh, kind of performance issues, this is not all about disease. I like to talk about healthy stuff, how to improve performance, how to make athletes more effective, those types of things. Um, that's, it's, that's at the nrgtribe.com. I blog on there routinely. I answer messages. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a great forum to get uh, answers, real answers, to all kinds of medical questions. Excellent. Well, we have a lot of questions, so let's get to it. Sure, go ahead. Um, one of the questions is, is there any difference in alcohol? For example, is there a difference between beer, wine, vodka? A lot of people on low-carb diets say that rye whiskey has fewer carbs. Do you have a feeling on that? Um, the answer is yes, that is that is um, true. Um, th there are differences. Um, of course, the sweeter beverages are like um, uh, wines and beer. Um, beer is probably one of the worst. It's just a pure wheat, which is a common allergen-based carbohydrate, um, and uh, it, lots of sugar in those. Even the low-carb ones are, are still enough to give you pr a diabetic problems. Um, and basically, wines probably are close. Yes, the hard liquors are um, less in the just pure absorbable carbohydrates, but I'd caution you on something about alcohol. And this is something, the reason I steer diabetics clear is keep in mind, you know the old studies about, you know, it's, it's good to drink one or two drinks a day, it's healthy, whatever. That's true if you don't have a disease, okay? That might be true for some people, but if you have diabetes, your body's already saying, I don't handle carbohydrates well. But alcohol is also a unique carbohydrate. It also is a stressor to the body. It creates an inflammatory process which cortisol responds to. So alcohol is one of these things that I like people to be careful with because um, besides the lowering in inhibitions, you might be more prone to snacking on things that you might normally uh, do. Alcohol actually has a couple of double negatives to it. So the answer to the question is it depends, um, yes, Probably uh, straight alcohols um, are probably better, um, it, it just on a pure carbohydrate basis. But in general, if you're diabetic, take this seriously. I mean, do you really have to drink alcohol? I mean, is that is that a is that something you have to do? And if so, why? You got to got to ask yourself those questions. Another question has to do with thyroid function. So um, we have often in the past, as part of our educational series, heard from a lot of speakers about suboptimal thyroid function that may not be diagnosed as flat-out hypothyroidism, and mm -hmm. that that plays um, a role in uh, different types of diseases. So does lowered thyroid function or re reduced metabolism play a role with type 2 diabetes? Yeah, it does. I mean, the thyroid is a sort of gas pedal in the body, and it does um, – it is much, very much associated with diabetic conditions. Many diabetics uh, often have a low thyroid function either clinically that we actually measure and treat or even subclinical hypothyroidism that can be picked up on symptom surveys and things like that. 
Um, one thing that I'll tell you, uh, my little tip on thyroid conditions, we often get transfixed by looking at thyroid condition, like, oh, it's the thyroid, my thyroid's low, I got thyroid symptoms. Your thyroid works with your adrenal glands very, very closely, okay? And the adrenals are much overlooked. And often, I believe a lot of these folks with subclinical thyroid problems actually have uh, adrenal issues, which are usually triggered by uh, unchecked stress or their nutritional habits. Um, and so a lot of times, the point of that is your thyroid can be treated by some of the same things I've already talked about and also uh, alerting yourself to the role that stress can play and how the thyroid functions. I'm, I'm sorry, and how the uh, adrenal glands function. Mm -hmm. So let's see. One, I'm going to combine a couple questions because I think they're similar topics. Uh, one has to do with trying to convince doctors to uh, be a little bit more open-minded about their approach, and the other says, uh, quotes you as saying, um, so many doctors are reluctant to open the toolbox. So what happened in your own personal life or your own professional practice to change your mind about the approach that you were taught? What you know, I always was a kind of independent thinker. Uh, my uh, grandmother used a lot of herbal uh, remedies and things like that. So I, I think deep down I probably had a little bit more of an alternative leaning. Um, but when I went to medical school, I was a good trooper coming out. Um, I get, put everybody on a low-fat, you know, cardiac diet. Um, I did all the things. I chastised the patients for not, you know, eating for eating their fat and eating their eggs and everything else. And then what I realized, I, I, I like to say it's because I'm just honest. I, I, I honestly look at patients and wonder, are the interventions I've told them, are they doing anything? And I universally, every time I was following these types of diets, I never saw improvement. And so it made me realize I'm not really doing anything for these people. And then you start exploring, you start realizing that there's other opinions about lifestyle, about nutrition, which I, I was not taught in medical school. You have to keep in mind it's a toolbox. Uh, going to medical school is a toolbox. And if you, can, if you hire a medical doctor to come do something, you say, I'd like to do this through nutrition and lifestyle, they might, if, if they attended, they might have had a two-hour class that they took that they had to show up three times in six weeks uh, for a couple hours at a time to talk about nutrition. That's it. I mean, there, that's not. It's not like we had this ginormous amount of, you know, powerful uh, and very in-depth nutritional talks in medical school. That's it. I'll be very honest about that. And I learned everything I know about nutrition outside of there. ACN courses, meeting with my chiropractic colleagues, um, taking on mentorships with people like Stuart White and others that are, have been. Guys that, you know, engaging those people to come teach my staff what to do and how to, how to understand nutrition. This is the way I learn nutrition and the way I realize, hey, you know, I, I created an effect by getting, uh, getting this person to um, change their habits. That, I, that's real to me. And so that's why I ended up going down that road. Another common question we have has to do with and I think we've all been in this boat at one time or another, whether it's about diabetes or another type of disease. But do you have any ex suggestions for listeners who have a loved one who is not taking their disease seriously? Well, ultimately I think the patient has to care about it themselves. You, you, you can't nag them to death, so to speak. Um, uh, but I will say that um, find out what's important to that person. Um, there's there's something that drives everyone. I just saw a patient a couple of days ago that um, really had been, he didn't have massively uncontrolled diabetes, but he was kind of coasting along to sort of, yeah, well, I'll probably watch my diet and I'll probably do this and that. And his numbers were always, he never could get into remission. He's always on medications. His grandson came to him one day. It's like a seven, he's an eight or nine year old. And he said, hey, granddad, I, I want you to be around. So I want you to take better control of your diabetes. This guy totally turned around. He goes to the gym four days a week. In fact, he was in the last time because he had a sore knee or something, you know, from working out so much. Uh, the, the reality is um, you've got to figure out what makes people tick and what, they're, what they find uh, interesting. Maybe it's somebody that used to do things like uh, athletic things, or maybe they used to like to go do things like hiking or outdoor activities, but they can't anymore because they're way overweight or whatever. Use that as an example to say, hey, this is something I know you love to do. I think it would be easier if you, you know, be more mobile, you'd have, uh, you know, you feel better and have more energy to do these things if you could do this. Look at it from a financial standpoint. We can't afford to do this. Your medicines cost $500 a month. You know, these medicines aren't curing the condition, they're just controlling the sugar. Maybe we could start working on some lifestyle things 
that lead to um, a reduction in medications. These, you know, you could go on this endlessly, but that, that's there's different ways. But I like to I like to focus on what is important to the patient. Um, here's a person who wants to know about. Um, let's see, have you ever had someone, or do you have statistics or studies on people that are type two people, people with type two diabetes who are on insulin? Um, are, are you ever able to turn the tide enough that they can get off the insulin? Yes, I have multiple cases like that. Um, I inherited several patients from uh, local endocrinologists that um, were on very, like, upwards of 100 units of combined insulin a day, um, and but had absolutely zero understanding of nutrition. Um, the first day I, this is just one example, the first day I met this woman, A1C was greater than 11, I think it was 12, or, uh, and she uh, was on 100 units of insulin a day, uh, combined insulin, in other words, multiple doses of the day. And so what happened is I put her on the dietary plan, and the first day I cut her insulin in half because I was fearful that she would get hypoglycemic very quickly. Um, within six weeks, um, I had to eliminate the uh, insulin because she was very strict about her diet and uh, doing the things I mentioned, and she did not require the insulin. In fact, even at cutting it back, she was having hypo I was causing her symptoms by the hypoglycemic spells. Um, I had another gentleman that did the very same thing. Uh, in fact, it was funny because he called me like a year later and he said, Doc, I was worried. I had a blood sugar of 300 the other day. And I said, well, what happened? And he says, I ate a piece of cake. And I said, well, <laughs> well, there you have it, you know. And he went right back. He never had a chain. You know, he just went right back to his routine diet, got, off, got back off the carbohydrates, and he does not require any insulin anymore. That happens a lot, actually. Um, there's people that can't. Don't get me wrong. I don't want to overplay that, okay? Mm -hmm. There's people that can't. There are people that they have burnt their pancreas out, does not work anymore, uh, or they are so far down the disease path, uh, the spiral, if you will, that we have to maintain them with some type of insulin or they just get toxic with their blood sugars. So there are people that we can't, but I will tell you I always try to minimize it. And so another question is, would juicing be considered a negative for diabetics? You know, where the, the current... In, you know, where you take whole vegetables, whole wheatgrass, whole fruits for juicing. I'm sorry, what's the question? Well, there's a practice called juicing. Oh, where juicing. You take, okay. Yeah, yeah, whole veg. So it's not just like the juice of, but yeah. the whole orange gets thrown in or the whole handful of alfalfa sprouts or the whole piece of celery. Uh, so it's whole, whole vegetables, whole fruit, but it's still liquefied. Is that considered a negative for people with diabetes? Um, I, I don't like the fruit in there. I'm okay with many uh, vegetables in there, and, and, and you could do that some, but I would say uh, the fruit, I don't, I don't want fruit juice in the diet of a diabetic. Okay. Awesome. Uh, let's see. You, do you do telephone consultations for people who do not live in your area? You do virtual visits, so the answer is yes. So to do that, they would. There's a contact. Is there a contact? Yeah. What they can do is, um, what they can do is get a hold of the uh, office through the web page and uh, ask that you just mentioned that they uh, heard about us. The Terry Talks Nutrition. They'd be interested in maybe doing a virtual consult. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. And let's see. I'm going back and forth. I want to make sure I haven't missed anything. What about your opinion on type one diabetes? Do you believe it's hereditary or people are born with it? Well, there's a lot of theories with it. I do believe there's a little bit more of a genetic component with type 1 diabetes. It's a completely different animal, really, compared to type 2 diabetes. Um, and I also believe there are potentially infectious disease or uh, sort of viral insults that cause uh, part of the diabetic uh, type 1 issue. But there is definitely a much stronger genetic uh, variable there. Um, I still, uh, with a type 1 diabetic, if you want to minimize insulin, um, you still can. You still should be on a lower carbohydrate diet. It's 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 still a better way to eat so that you can um, minimize the amount of insulin you do need. I've got uh, I've got uh, teenagers that um, that I've treated and adults with type one diabetes that are athletes um, that do very competitive you know sports and whatnot. And they do a great job of controlling their A1C, um, keeping it well down very close to the remission range by simply being very diligent about carbohydrate restriction, and they use minimal, I'm talking like two or three units at a meal um, of insulin, it's minimal. That's, that's, a, that's nothing compared to what a lot of type 1 diabetics use. So although this talk is very different than type 1, you have to distinguish the two, 
there still are some similarities that says, well, if I don't want to use a lot of insulin or too much because of the potential hazards of, of excess insulin, well, I still want to limit processed carbs and, and excessive carbohydrates in the diet. Um, a lot of uh, people who work in the natural health world use pancretin, which is a, an enzyme produced uh, that contains the three different enzymes. You know, you've got the lipase, the amylase, and the protease. Uh, right. They use the pancretin for a variety of issues in the body, but do you believe that using pancretin with your meals helps to take any kind of load off of the pancreas? Uh, yeah, I'm not talking specifically about diabetes uh, with this, but the answer I'm giving right now, but yes, um, I use digestive enzymes all the time for, for similar purpose. Um, and in fact, a lot of diabetics have di gastrointestinal issues, they have bile flow issues, and they may have sluggish uh, pancreatic function. So I, I do believe that using those types of products uh, definitely um, improve digestion, which is always a good thing. Um, if you're improving your digestion, you absorb your minerals, vitamins, and nutrients much better. And uh, so, yeah, I think that's, a, that's helpful to do. Uh, it, whether it helps the pancreas makes it, I don't know. I, I will say probably it takes a load off of it because one of the traditional therapies for a low pancreatic function, like somebody who's had a pancreatic injury or that kind of thing, is to give them things like pancreatin and, and uh, digestive enzymes basically so that the pancreas doesn't have to work hard. So I'd say the answer is probably yes uh, to taking the load off, and it's definitely beneficial. Um, here's a, a question that you may or may not be able to answer, but you talked about there's a 100% chance of some type of interaction when you use three or more medications together. Uh, would you say that this applies to supplements as well? Um, potentially herbal supplements. Um, I, I don't. I typically use a lot of food-based supplements, and so um, foods, no, I wouldn't put them in that category. When I use herbals, I always look at, at, at them as um, potential uh, medications. Um, they, they are processed in many of the same ways that drugs are, um, and uh, so I, I, I'm not as concerned. I know there's a lot more, uh, uh, a lot more leeway as far as um, dosing and things like that with a lot of the herbals. Um, so I would say um, it, it, not food-based supplements, um, but probably um, you, you'd probably lump herbals into that category, at least use them more carefully. But that is definitely true for synthetic and man-made uh, uh, drugs. Mm -hmm. And it may also be, and, and correct me if this is something that you don't agree with, but uh, even when you use a single herbal supplement or a single dietary supplement, uh, let's just say you take a, oh gosh, I have to come up with something quickly, a ginkgo product. Um, that ginkgo is not one thing. It's made up of several different compounds. Uh, let's say that you're taking rose hips for vitamin C. That's not just vitamin C. Those are several compounds. When you're dealing with drugs, it's one single compound generally. So ibuprofen is merely ibuprofen, and acetaminophen is merely acetaminophen. But what we see with interactions, when you look in the dietary supplement world, very seldom do you see any type of harm reported to the FDA database on nutrients causing other nutrients to cause some harm, where I don't believe the same is true when you're talking about drugs. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. That's a great analysis. Um, medications are refined. Many of them were refined from herbs and plants and whatnot, and they're very targeted and very focused. That's why they can have very dramatic or even toxic effects. Um, and so I would agree with that, uh, the way you characterize that, definitely. Okay. All right. I think... I'm going to glance through the, the, the chat and the QA boxes to make sure I did not miss anything. Um, let's see. All right, I think uh, there was a, uh, one question I did miss, and it had to do with do you measure uh, different, um, do you have different measures of inflammation? Do you do checks on systemic inflammation? And if so, what kinds of tests do you do? Yes, um, sometimes I'll do that. Um, not so much just for diabetics. Um, sometimes I'll do CRP levels, cardiac CRP levels uh, on diabetic patients, especially if I'm, it doesn't, it's not that it really changes my management of the case. It's just that sometimes I use those labs as tools, further evidence to, to share with the patient. So if I got a patient that just psychologically is not coping well or doesn't feel like uh, maybe I'm overplaying um, the hand with diabetes, I'll show them, I'll say, well, inflammation is a problem with heart disease. Oh, look, your CRP is elevated. One more reason you need to take this very seriously. So 
Uh, now, with other medical conditions, yes, uh, those inflammatory markers, CRP, SED rates, those are definitely utilized in those situations uh, for rheumatism and others. Okay, excellent. Well, I believe we finally made it through our long list of questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Curtis. I learned a great deal about diabetes and diabetes management today. I hope you'll come back in the future for another webinar. Yeah, just call anytime. We had a lot of fun. It was good. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, thank you all for attending today. Uh, before we go, I wanted to announce our next upcoming educational webinars. Uh, psoriasis, eczema, and other common skin diseases, Heal the Skin You're In, on May 19th at 1 p.m. And then we have a special two-hour event uh, with Dr. Jacob Teitelbaum and Dr. Neil Nathan on the diagnosis and treatment of Lyme disease from all perspectives, and that includes the mainstream medical interventions as well as nutrient and dietary supplement and natural medicine interventions. Uh, we are extremely pleased to have this special two-hour event, uh, so I hope that you'll be able to join us for that. So thank you all for taking time out of your busy day to learn more about natural medicine interventions. And until we meet again, good health to you. Bye-bye.